I wanted to make a read making video that took you through absolutely every step of my read making process. I failed a little bit in that when you're done with a read, you're not ever really completely done with the read, as many different factors might change uh, the final product and weather might mean that you would have to make an adjustment weeks after you've considered the read to be finished. And before I make a read, before the step you're seeing here now, I will take the cane and soak it and dry it repeatedly over the course of about two weeks. I feel that this stabilizes the cane in terms of how it shrinks and expands as it gets wet and dries. I want to get this over with before I start really removing any material. So when I get to the finishing stages, the reed only changes because I'm causing it to vibrate when I'm breaking in the reed by playing it. It's not going to shrink suddenly on me or change in any other unpredictable way because of simply soaking the reed and drying it. So the process that you're seeing now is simply shaping a piece of gouged cane. I buy the cane gouged. I don't do splitting and gouging of my own cane, so I am skipping a step in that sense as well. But I'm shaping gouged cane on a straight shaper. Uh, this is made similarly to a fox straight shaper, although this was custom made for me by a machinist uh, in California who is unassociated with any double reed company of any kind. So it's a completely one of a kind shaper. The original drawings for this shape were lost in a computer crash too. So um, if I ever wanted this copied, I would have to send it to someone with the right sophisticated machinery to correctly copy the dimensions of the shaper. It does use Fox screw pins, however. It's a similar shape, I guess, to um, many common American shapes, such as a Rieger 2 or a Rieger 1A, maybe a Fox 2 shape, um, but it, it's designed with specific dimensions in terms of the width, especially in the throat and in the tube area, although with a fairly wide tip and uh, laterally in terms of where the narrowest point is, I specifically designed this shape with particular wire measurements in mind. So after shaping the reed, uh, I'll put this on a profiler. So the profiling stage is another one that's fairly automated. There's not much different that I do compared to what anybody else would do, uh, with one small exception. Um, I'm not sure how common this is on straight shapers, but the straight shaper that I use has a notch in the center. You may have seen me uh, make a little score marking there. It helps me line the center of the cane up with the center score marking on the profiler barrel. If the cane isn't exactly centered based on the score marks on the ends of the cane. This is the MD Reads Profiler. I like its simplicity. It's a single barrel profiler. Um, to be completely honest with you, I'm not even sure what the advantage of a double barrel profiler would be after using this machine for a while. <clears throat> it gets the cane pretty darn close to what you need. My only complaint about this machine is that it doesn't have any automated scoring tools. So you can't score the collar or the center. So you end up with this flare of cane in the center of the reed as you're working your way down each side as you pass uh, because there's nothing in the center to cut that out. So you deal with it. Um, the best way to use a profiler like this is to start with one pass on one side, flip it around, and then do two passes on the alternate side which gets you down a second layer. Then you flip it around and you do two passes. So you're alternating depths on either side. This is to prevent buildup of that flared cane in the center of the barrel of the profiler.
So the one thing that I do differently at the end of the profiling process is I have Paul Deegan include a secondary score line on the ends of the cane, on the ends of the barrel. So normally there's a score line indicating a centered piece of 120 millimeter cane. What I had him do is add one score marking two millimeters inside from that score marking. It gives me a measurement point to mark a score on with my uh, knife two millimeters from the end which gives my gardening shears there a place to latch onto to trim two millimeters off of either end of the tube. Uh, most people will use 120 millimeter cane. I prefer to shorten the tube a little bit um, for total overall dimension reasons. So before forming I will score the bark on the tube side. I use a metal scribe tool to accomplish this task first. So I'll draw seven lines and then I will score twice in each of those little line grooves a little bit deeper. What is nice about a metal scribe tool is that it actually removes a fair amount of the bark and creates a wide trough for the score. I then use this X-Acto blade to cut a narrow point deeper into the trough, creating a kind of a letter V or a letter Y kind of shape for each score line. The idea being is that it allows the bark to flex a little bit more and I don't need to cut all the way through the blade at any given point in order to get it to form around in the forming process. I go from about the second wire. I found no discernible difference if I score all the way up to the first wire or in between the first and second wire in terms of how many reeds will crack or where they crack. So I like the look of a reed without the score markings visible above the second wire, although some extended cracks might show up between the first and second wire, but um, I kind of like those. But I don't like the fake look of the scoring. So the next step, forming the tube round. One nice thing about that profiler, by the way, is that it actually creates a nice spot in the center that folds easily. I don't have to, cons I don't even have to think about it at all. It's going to fold down the center all the time. Uh, this might also be a byproduct of the notch that's created by the shaper. Uh, so I soak the cane in fairly warm water before this process. So I, I guess I haven't measured it, but it's probably right around 130 degrees, which is about what a warm cup of coffee is at. So to give yourself a point of reference, I generally go with basically the hottest tap water that I can get out of my tap. I feel like the warmer water softens the cane enough to make it a little bit more pliable than if it were room temperature water or even worse, cold water. So after wrapping it in the packing twine, I will put it, dip it back in the water so that it brings up the temperature of the cane from having been out of the water for a bit as I wrap it. And it also saturates the thread a little bit so that that compresses a little bit more around the cane to help form the tube in an even round. I then will leave it on the mandrel for a moment while I wrap my next reed, as you see here. I use a Rieger elliptical tip forming mandrel. I like how easy it goes in and it opens up the tube nicely without forcing too extreme of an arch in the throat area of the reed which I think causes cracking when you use a lot of purely round forming mandrels. So this is a, a way to kind of ease the reed into its new shape um, using that elliptical tip for that forming mandrel. So once I've got the next reed wrapped, then I'll take the previous one off the forming mandrel and put it on the drying rack, which again, I use a Rieger brand drying rack. I like the shape of the pins of these. Uh, this drying rack will then open the throat a little bit more. So this is rounder in the throat area than the drying or than the uh, forming mandrel. So it opens up the throat a little bit more. Uh, I'll never get any cracking on the forming mandrel, but I might get some cracking if I'm a little too brutal putting it on the drying rack itself. Fast forward two weeks. I let the cane sit on that drying rack for two weeks 
to really completely stabilize in its new position. Uh, you could probably get away with doing my process with letting it sit there for 24 or 48 hours, but I like to give the cane some time to sit and kind of age as a blank a little bit before putting the wires on. So I unfold the wire, or unfold the, the, uh, the blank as it is, and uh, take a file, and this is when I do the beveling process. So I'm able to do this really nicely because the tube is now going to give me two nice semicircles, which I can bevel the edge off of the tube, about five millimeters worth of, five, five millimeters of a full bevel and then a blending three or four millimeters back farther and then a couple of quick swipes with the sandpaper um, just to knock off whatever rough edge might be on the inside of the entire blade. It's not a real bevel though. I then put the wires on three, two, one. So this is going to be the third wire closest to the end. And I measure this wire at just below five millimeters. So the wires sit between four and five millimeters uh, as measured on the ruler. So this is one of those measurements that was taken into account deliberately when I made that shape design. So I'll nudge it up uh, on the normal mandrel. This is just a regular Rieger mandrel at this point um, to give it a little more support in the throat area once I put the first wire on. Um, and I use a Leatherman tool to cut the wires because it has a scissor action style wire cutter which cuts cleanly every time and it's also spaced away from the edge of the plier portion of the uh, tool so that I get the same length wire cut on every wire on every reed, which I like that consistency. The second wire goes at 40 millimeters from the fold. So I measure the second and the first wire from the fold, and I measure the third wire from the butt end of the tube. Uh, the first and second wire are more directly interactive with the tip, whereas the third wire is actually interacting with the bevel mostly, so that's why I measure from either end of the reed, depending on which wire we're talking about. The first wire then goes eight millimeters up from that second wire. I measure from the top of the wire, if you consider the top of the wire the one closest to the fold. So some people will, or will measure from the top of the wire, actually measure from the where the wires meet. So sorry, the, most people will measure from the top of the wire. I measure from the center where the two lines of wire actually meet. That's where I put the end of the ruler. So uh, depending on how you decide to measure, you might get a full millimeter off of someone else's measurements if you measure from the bottom of the wire and they measure from the top. So I measure from the middle. Uh, this should give me um, one and a half millimeters of distance between the end of the wire and the collar itself. So the difference between blade and bond length in my reeds is going to be about one and a half millimeters. So I wrap using cotton thread. I like the way that cotton thread grips not only the cane but also just in my hands so that when I'm wrapping it it doesn't slip like I find nylon thread too. I wrap from the turban first and then going up but this is purely aesthetic. Um, I don't actually care how nylon thread ages with the reed though, so in, in a sense there is a bit of a function to using cotton for me, but other people don't have that problem, so just as you make different reeds, you might get different results with the same materials. So for me, cotton thread absorbs duco cement in a way that I like. It doesn't separate from the reed over time, and I find it easy to work with. I also wrap using two strands of thread at the same time, which means that I don't have to twist the reed around as many times, so it's a little faster than using one strand of thread. And I don't make a particularly large turban, partially because my third wire is so close to the end I don't have all that much space to do that, but also because a bigger turban means more time wrapping. And if I'm going to do this on 20 reeds in one day, I want to wrap as little times around as possible in order to get the result. I tie a really simple knot right below the second wire. I do wrap all the way up to the second wire and then cut the end off. I use a pair of end cutting nippers to cut the third wire flush with the turban. 
There are ways of forming the tube and wrapping so that you can fold the wire up under the thread, but I'm lazy, so I just clip it off. The cutters that I use get it nice and flush with the thread, so you're not going to poke yourself. Give it one coat of Duco cement, and that's it. Uh, a second coat of Duco cement might give the end result of the, the reed a little different finish in terms of smoothing out the texture of the thread. I actually like the texture of the thread, and two coats of Duco cement aren't going to seal the reed any differently than one. So I saturate the entire thing, and I will blow on it to uh, sort of speed up the drying process, but what is more important, and you can barely see me on the reed here, but you can see the th string being blown away a little bit there in the upper right hand corner. Um, what I'm doing really is getting the surface of the Duco cement to fog up a little bit as the surface dries quickly under me blowing on it. It allows me to see if I've missed any spots a little easier. So then the next day, uh, after the Duco cement's totally dry, I'll soak up the reeds for a couple of minutes, fold the wires down for the first time, and do my reaming process. Again, I use Rieger tools for this. I have a Rieger spiral reamer with a reamer stop that doesn't get moved. Uh, so I ream to exactly the same place every time. I don't need to check it against my vocal or against my mandrel or anything else because I know that I'm always going to ream to the same spot. Uh, cleaning it out every couple of passes with the toothbrush because the beveling process does mean that I'm going to have to ream quite a bit. So this reamer will take a good amount out of both the tube and the throat area. So that gives me a little more open space in the throat area of the reed, but and gives me a good uh, fit against my vocal this way too. I'll use a diamond reamer to finish this process up just to smooth the texture of the inside out in case the spiral reamer ripped some of the cane rather than cut the cane away. Um, but I only need to do a couple of quick twists here and there. Twist, twist, twist. Knock and blow out any sawdust that happens to be on the inside. And if there's any stragglers in terms of cane fibers sticking out inside, I'll just pull those out with a diamond rat tail file. And then using a Rieger tip cutter, because I can't cut straight on a cutting block with a knife to save my life, um, I'll clip the tip at this point. So ream and then clip the tip. I clip to just shy of 29 millimeters according to the measurements on the tip cutter, but that measurement doesn't agree with my ruler when I go back later, so you can kind of ignore that number. So for the beginning of the finishing process, I use this tip profiling machine. This is made by the Rimple R-I-M-P-L. Uh, in America, this is sold by Justin Miller. Uh, under the Ultimate Reed Finishing Machine name. Uh, but it is just a tip profiler like uh, any other, except that it does use a slightly different technology to use a template and how it cuts. Um, I do recommend this machine a lot. It is expensive, but it does a really excellent job if you like the template that you are using. Um, the Rieger Tip Profiler also does a really excellent job. It profiles slightly differently. The default templates are quite different, but both give me good results. Um, I liked how this one operated and uh, thought it was worth the investment for me to get this particular machine. Uh, I've heard people's responses to the templates varying. Uh, I like what this one is doing for me. This was the standard template when I bought the machine back in 2006 or seven might have been as late as 2008 that I got this machine. I will need to cut a little bit of particular cane out uh, of the area that would be covered by the tip profiler. It does leave the heart, for me anyway, it leaves the heart a little bit on the heavy side. Um, and the other trick to using this machine is to make sure you go from the outside in, otherwise it will rip your corners off. So after doing the profiling, the Corners are nice and thin, so I can use a razor blade and a cutting block to very accurately cut 45 degree angle uh, corners off the tip. I like to do that because it does help me with my upper register response and also prevents you from having to uh, watch out for those corners uh, in your lips or maybe in your reed case uh, if it 
the reed happens to grab a corner, it can split, and you don't want that. So in a way, it protects the reed. So again, I mentioned the MD profiler that I have doesn't have a collar scoring tool. So what you see here is me using my knife to cut that score uh, where the collar is. It's easy to see. It's just not a line that's been cut very well by the profiler. So I cut that in, and then I actually cut backwards against the reed towards my scoring line. So I'm actually cutting towards the first wire here, only about a millimeter worth of the blade uh, in order to just create a rigid 90 degree angle collar where the blade begins. And then having done this many, many times over several hundred reeds, I pretty much know exactly where I need to scrape after the reed has come off the tip profiler. So the first thing that I'm doing is pulling the heart back a little bit and opening up the tip area to make the tip area a little longer. Um, the, the first scrape that I'll do. <clears throat> so I'm just checking it against my lamp right now. I'm using a Rieger transparent plaque uh, so that I can hold it up to my desk lamp and look through the reed with the plaque. I, th I like how the plaque dissipates the air or the uh, the light a little bit inside the reed so that it's easy to see the shading of the cane. Uh, different pieces of cane might shade differently, so you really do have to just look relative to the piece of cane you're working on. If you have a consistent profiler and tip profiler, then you can trust that what you're looking at should be relative to itself. So to make sure that the that I'm pulling back the heart area and the tip area evenly on both blades. The next thing that you do, this tip profiler does a lot on the wings compared to some other profilers. So what I'm doing here is um, scraping the very sides of the reed on the back third or so in order to get that to blend towards what the tip profiler has done. Otherwise, there's a very dramatic uh, ramping down of the thickness on the very sides of the reed because the profiler that I have isn't set up to do a spine or any sort of side to center distance um, profiling. I have to do it with a knife there. So then I'll take a standard triangle file, not a diamond file. I like to dip it in water because it cuts a little quicker and I'm blending out the rough cuts that I did with the knife on the sides that I was just talking about. And also this is going to clean up any sort of in inconsistencies with the rather brutal way that I make the collar by cutting backwards towards the first wire. So I'm using the file to kind of blend that all together. So I, generally speaking, use the file as a blending tool uh, to even out any sort of inconsistencies with my knife technique. I rarely or barely use the knife at all in my reed making process, so I'm not quite as finessed at it as, say, many of my oboe playing friends are. So after I've done that, I might crow the reed, um, but uh, I'm not going to bother playing it on the instrument today. I just want to crow it to make sure that it's not completely wrong. Um, I want it to be a nice low crow on this first day. So then, this is the first time that I'll actually sit to my reed making desk with my instrument put together when I'm working on this reed. So the first thing that I'm going to do is crow it, and I can immediately tell that it's stiffened up since just the one previous crow that I've done on the reed. So I'm checking the thickness again by using my desk lamp and noticing that some inconsistencies in the cane have kind of shown up after having dried and then re-soaked again after going through the tip profiling process. So I'm scraping out areas that I see that jive with what I felt when I crowed the reed. Um, there isn't a whole lot of uh, magic to this. It, it really does come down to having consistently made reeds the same way for a long time and knowing what to expect. So this process is really kind of boring to talk through. So if you want to skip ahead, you can uh, look at the number that I'm going to put up on the caption that puts you to the next day's scraping if you don't want to look at me scraping my read. But basically the process that I'm doing is the same as the first day, 
cut with the knife to the point that I need to uh, be accurate with and then use the file to blend it out. I'll then use 1000 grit sandpaper to smooth out the uh, entire blade of the reed. So I'll adjust the tip opening of the reed and then make its first ugly sounds. So I only wanted to play on that reed for a little while. It's a bit of a break-in procedure, it's a bit of a testing procedure. For the most part I'm just trying to get the reed to vibrate a little bit so that the cane stiffens for the next day. So you'll hear it's not the greatest sounding reed in the world yet. Um, I actually want it to be pretty ugly on these first few days of the reed's life. If it's too stable, then that means it's probably going to be far too hard to be responsive in the low register, especially uh, in a week or so. So I want the E to sag. I probably want the C sharp to sag. Um, and I'm going for a very vibrant, rich, low register. Uh, I've come to know my reads well enough to know basically the lowest register, the, the open F down to low B flat, if, it, if that register plays the way that I want it to, then I know that the upper register is going to play well. So I'm really going to focus mostly on how easy 
the instrument responds with this reed in the lowest, especially octave, uh, how quickly I can articulate on a low B natural and low B flat, how open and rich low D is. So at this point, I'm pretty much going to consider the reed to be done. Um, it's a little soft yet, but the next day that's going to really be more stable, but the low register will still be responsive. So while this isn't the prettiest sound right now, the goal of this is to say I'm probably not going to scrape this reed much, if at all, anymore. Might take some sandpaper to it, but uh, I would pretty much consider this one to be a completed read. Thanks for watching.